unto the truth. The church of the living God. Please turn to Romans 10. Thirty years ago, I, I probably would have been in a bar or who knows where. But God's given me life and life more abundantly to hunger and thirst for his word. And I, I never fail to get so much out of Wednesday night services. Um, it doesn't matter who's preaching. I always get a lot, but I, I really love to be with the saints. I love to come into the church of the living God. I love the midweek services. And even if it's a small group, it's, it's even better almost because it feels like we're just a small family serving the Lord together. Now, my kids did, gave me one, um, one bit of instruction. They said, Dad, don't go as long as you've been going. So I promised I wouldn't. But I said, you know what? Paul preached a sermon so long one time that a young man fell asleep and fell out of a window. And I said, and they said, Dad, you're lucky there's no windows around here. <laughs> so that's okay. Um, all right. Praise the Lord. Let's, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 in verse 1. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Moses describes the law, or describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which does those things shall live by them. And Romans, like I've said before, is, is my favorite book of the Bible. If I was stranded on a desert island, I'd want Romans. Romans is called the constitution of the Bible because it, 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 it's got a preamble. It lays out the tenets, the articles of our faith. And, and, you know, then it even has the Bill of Rights or what, what Christians can do as a result of, of believing and the faith that we have and, and what we shouldn't do. Okay, so um, it's really called the Constitution. Now, I, I think about that a lot because the Constitution, you know, if you look at the definition, it's a, a guide for belief and behavior. Uh, what we put into practice each living day. So, so being an American citizen, we live and behave by the law that, that men have free speech and that men have freedom of religion and that men have freedom of conscience. You can think what you want to think, all right? Um, you can, you, you know, we have a right to protect ourselves and our families. We have a right not to be put in jail for no apparent reason or to be illegally searched and seized and, and people, you know. So, so there's so many things that, that our Constitution gives us that the book of Romans gives us as Christians. And, uh, and I think about that a lot because I, I, I believe our Constitution is under attack. If, if you look at even evangelicism, the, you know, what, what book are they coming after? Well, a lot of times they're coming after the Old Testament, right? Um, evangelicals like Charles Stan, or I'm not, not Charles Stanley, but his son, Andy Stanley, who was a very, very wicked person in, in terms of the, the heresies that he's purveying. But, but, you know, basically saying, hey, we need to jettison the Old Testament. Okay. Um, Jesus said, I, I came to fulfill the law, not to get rid of the law and the prophets. In fact, Everything that Paul and Jesus said was out of the Old Testament. And never once did they denigrate or negate or, or downplay the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus said, you better read the Old Testament right before I come back. Let the reader of Daniel understand. If you don't understand Daniel, you're going to have a hard time understanding anything. So, you know, Jesus is saying, hey, it's critical. And what, you know, what is the whole Old Testament built around? The Ten Commandments. Everything in the Old Testament revolves around love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? And so, so to, to jettison that is the, the essence of heresy according to the biblical constitution. So, so these false preachers like, like uh, Andy Stanley and Rob Bell, 
and, and Tommy Tinney says, hey, you know, we don't need any of the other parts of the Bible except the Gospels. The epistles are love letters. We need to see what, what God's doing today. Well, God's not going to do anything that he hasn't already said he's going to do. Everything that we believe is out of his playbook, out of his rule book, out of his guidebook. Okay, in fact, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Now think about this for a second. If, and, and we're going to read this in a little bit, but faith comes by hearing. And what opens up our ears? And hearing comes by the word of God. If you want to have faith, you got to hear. And if you want to hear, you got to have the word of God. The just shall live by the word of God. Does that make sense? It, I wasn't very good in math, but logic was one thing that I was good in. Okay. And um, if you put those things together, it's quite clear. God's word is so important. And you see the same thing, people denigrating our Constitution. Uh, you, you know... Uh, they're trying to take away the First Amendment. In fact, you go on most college campuses and you, you're not even allowed to express your feelings or thoughts as if it's not a left-wing ideology that's been approved by the campus authorities, okay? So our Constitution's under attack. Um, if you look at some of the people that got elected, um, they fit right into the spirit of this age, and um, we're seeing that all over. So, but, but I want to start talking about Israel. Paul paints a picture of Israel and says he loves them. These are his people, you know. Can you imagine? I mean, I, I, I think that all of us probably have similar love for our fellow Iowans or fellow Cedar Rapidians or fellow, you know, U.S. citizens, and we love them. What a country that stood up to Nazism, that stood up to totalitarianism, that stood up to communism, that, that was a good country, e even at our very worst. Uh, you know, people would come here saying, righteousness booms from all the pulpits. People live by a moral code. Um, it's just incredible when you read the history and, and you look at what America's accomplished. Um, even as, as, as kids, you know, learning that, you know, you grew up in a country where men laid their lives down for freedom, laid their lives down to set men free, laid their lives down to, to defend the world, a fight not even our own, really. World War I, World War II, we could have sat out. We didn't have to send our best men over to die. But uh, um, what a country. Started out by, you know, many, in many cases, Christian, um, Christians who were persecuted in Europe and wanted to come here. I just did work yesterday in a town called Pella, Iowa. Okay, Pella. Anybody know where Pella comes from, the word Pella? Anybody remember that from the Bible? When, when the Christians that were in Jerusalem during the Roman siege, um, the Romans inexplicably went, you know, called off their troops just for a short time while Titus had to go back to Rome to settle things in Rome. The Christians were able to escape the siege. And where'd they go? To a small town called Pella. And we had so many, so many Dutch Christians who, who came to Iowa to settle. They named it Pella, which I, I believe means a place of refuge. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, beautiful. So, so we have a, a tremendous Christian heritage all across the United States. Groups of persecuted Christians who wanted to come and start over and build a country based on the rule of law and, and faith and goodwill. And, and now we see that being slowly and surely chipped away in it and, and ebbing away. And the same thing happened to Israel. And he says he prayed. Paul says he prayed for Israel. They have a zeal but not according to knowledge. And remember, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They were ignorant of God's righteousness. What is God's righteousness? Well, first of all, righteousness means right standing with God. How do you obtain right standing with God? He whose hands are clean, he who's never sinned, he who's never lifted his hand toward idolatry or never sinned and fallen short. Well, that's, that's pretty scary because I don't know anybody who meets that. <laughs> uh, meets those requirements. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the point of the law is not that we can, we can attain righteousness in and of ourselves. We can climb a ladder. I'm getting better and better. If I just figure out how to quit lying to people, I'm a better person. 
if I can just not want to kill that guy and not actually do it, I'm, I'm getting better. If I can quit thinking those bad thoughts, and you're climbing a ladder, right? Well, that doesn't do it. Why? Because nothing, something has to pay for all the previous sins that we've committed. And even if we could, we can't just sweep those under the carpet, right? We were born in sin. So what's the law? The law, then, is like a mirror that shows us our own sin, our own nature, our own uh, uh, trespasses in the sight of God. It, you know, you can think you look great getting ready to go out, and all of a sudden your hair's all disheveled, you haven't shaved, and there's a smudge all over your face and dirt. Oh my goodness, I'm in trouble. I need to clean up. Well, if the law does its work, where do we end up? Right at the feet of Jesus. Lord, I can't do it. I'm a sinful man. It's not just sin on the outside. It's sin deep down on the inside. I've got something inside of me that gravitates toward sin. And if you're honest with yourself, you look in the mirror and you say, I can't do it. Jesus, help me. If you lie to yourself, you say, well, I'm, I'm trying. I'm getting better. I'm, you're comparing yourself to somebody. On, on Judgment Day, you're not going to be compared to anybody else. Not Charles Manson, not Jeffrey Dahmer, not the guy that shot up Las Vegas. You're going to be compared to righteousness, God's holy law. Have you ever lied? Have you ever stole? Have you ever thought a bad thought? Oops. Okay. So it says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness have gone about to establish their own righteousness and have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Right standing, the, uh, right standing with God demands that I be honest. I am a sinner. I have fallen short. There is nothing I can do to pay for the past sins. And Lord, I know tomorrow, who knows, I could go out and commit the most heinous sins. I need you. And it says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Christ, you end up right at his feet. You end up believing in him. Okay, turn, turn to Matthew 9. It, it shows it a little bit better. Matthew 9. Uh, I love the gospel because it, it's so deep. Matthew 9, verse 9. And Jesus passed from there and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at, at um, Matthew's house, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now, these aren't Republicans, okay? Uh, these are tax collectors who were, were basically traitors, treasonous people working with the Romans to collect money from their own people and then taking the profits. Now, I mean, that'd be like the Chinese conquering America and setting up, um, you know, Americans who were sympathetic to the Chinese cause to help collect money from us. W would we like those people and treat them nice? Probably not. Um, so, so he was probably closer to a Democrat, actually. Um, and, sorry, political. And sinners came and sat down with him. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why does your master eat with publicans and sinners? But Jesus heard that, and he said unto them, They that are whole do not need a physician, <clears throat> but they that are sick, excuse me. But go you and learn what it means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, if you read the Bible long enough, you realize Jesus is way ahead. And I hope it keeps falling. Sorry about that. He's way ahead. And he's actually, he's speaking using irony. Okay, what's the ironic thing about this? They that are whole do not need a physician. Well, that's correct. Only they that are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What's the irony there? The irony is that none of us are righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He's speaking to them, and they're thinking, yeah, that's right. You came to call sinners, not, not us righteous people. 
not realizing that they were the very ones who needed Jesus just as badly, maybe even more than the publicans and sinners. Who knows? At least the publicans and sinners knew that they were sinners. All right? It's one thing to know you need help. It's another thing to be blissfully ignorant and continue on thinking you're fine when you actually have stage four cancer. Okay. All right, go back to Romans chapter 10. And Jesus continues, or uh, I'm sorry, the Bible continues. And it says, Paul was concerned about his countrymen and he knew that, that, that they, had, they, had, they were in big trouble. And, and we're going to finish this later. But, but it says, remember when the Jews said, we'll not have this man to rule over us. Okay. Hosea chapter 1, go ahead and read it on your own time. But Hosea chapter 1 says um, the, that, that my people will no longer be my people. I, I will reject them. Okay, and then a few verses later it says, in the place where I have rejected them, I am going to come back to them, and they again will be my people, and, 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 and I will be their God. Okay, so, so Israel c committed what was called the national sin. Okay, the sin that led to their destruction. Now what sin was that? That sin was rejecting God, rejecting the Messiah when he came. Now, Believe it or not, God used that. He works all things together for good to those who love him. And he ended up using Israel's rejection of the gospel to bring the gospel to Germany, to bring the gospel to France, to bring the gospel to Spain, to bring the gospel to America, to South, South America, to Africa. Um, it was because of their rejection that the gospel came to us and to our, uh, to our ancestors. Okay. And... And the Bible says that very soon the Jewish people are, are going to look upon him and confess their sins. They will look upon me whom they pierced and mourn for me as for an only son. Jesus said, you won't see me again, Israel, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you believe that today? They are going, these Jewish people that have been brought back from the four corners of the earth are once again going to look to their Messiah. Um, and I hope I, I hope I have a part to play in that. So let's go back to Romans 10, verse 6. And it says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaks this way, Say not in your heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? Or that is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But, but what does it say? The word of God is nigh you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. Okay, Paul, Paul is quoting here from Deuteronomy 30. So hold your hand in Romans 10 and go to Deuteronomy 30. If it was up to, to Andy Stanley, we wouldn't even be turning to the Old Testament. We wouldn't even be reading these precious verses that God's given us. Did you know that the Bible says every word of God is, is important for us? Every word of God is critical for us, for, for correcting us, for helping us, for guiding us along in our path. Okay? Not one single jot or tittle is going to disappear from this law, no matter what Andy Stanley says. I guarantee it. Because Jesus said, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. Amen. Amen. But, so I'll make you a bet, Andy Stanley. God's word's going to last longer than you if you watch this video. Uh, chapter 30, Deuteronomy, in, um, in verse 10, it says, and this is God speaking to Israel here, if you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of the law, and if you turn unto the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Okay, what does turning? Turning is changing your mind. Turning is repenting. Turning is rethinking. Okay? Um, you, you cannot come to God unless you repent. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You can't, you can't come to God unless you turn. Israel had to turn. We have to turn. Lord, I'm a sinner. I don't want to continue in my sin. Forgive me of my sin. Help me, Lord. Save me. 
Okay, turning, repenting, changing our mind. And it says, if you turn with all your heart and with all your soul, for this commandment which I command you this day is not hidden from you, neither is it far off. Uh, it is not in heaven that you should say, who shall go up for us into heaven or bring it, uh, bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. And neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. But the word of God is very near you, in your mouth, in your heart, that you may do it. Okay, so, so he gives us his word, and it's not far off. It, it's right here. But he's given us one other thing that, that's critically important. It's our conscience. It's, 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 it's our very inner witness. The very worst people on the earth, I guarantee it, they've got a conscience. Now, they may treat that conscience like a worm and, di and dismiss it and not listen to it, and do everything they can against that conscience telling them. But when that conscience hears the word of God, love your neighbor as yourself. Pray for those who despitefully treat you. Um, do, do good to others. Love your neighbor. You know what I mean? Pray for those. When your, your conscience and your inner witness hears that, that, that is a witness against you if you don't listen to that. God's put that word in our very heart, through his conscience. Now, like I said, people suppress the conscience. People suppress the truth. But that inner witness hears the truth. In fact, Romans 1 says men are without excuse. There is not going to be anyone that stands at the pearly gates at, on judgment day and stands before God and can, can honestly say, I never knew, I never heard, I never. I don't know what you're talking about. They all had a witness. God's made sure that everyone has heard the word. It hasn't been far from them. Um, and, and notice, it's right here. You don't have to go anywhere special for it. You don't have to go into a trance. You don't have to ask someone else to interpret it for you. It's all right here. In very simple terms. Praise God. And, and, you know, it goes on to say in different parts of Deuteronomy, it says, make sure you teach your kids. Make sure that you use your time wisely and teach them. Uh, why is that? Why is it so important? Because you know, how many know that this world teaches our kids? <laughs> There's a million and one ways that this world teaches our kids. I used to think that, that, you know, as long as I guarded my children from the liberals in the local high schools, and, and the, if I guarded the TV a little bit, uh, we'd be okay. Well, now you've got... 200 different apps or different people in Twitter and Facebook and, and, and everybody is speaking so many words and teaching so many things. Um, so he says, make sure you teach your kids. Train them in the ways of the Lord so that when they're old, they will depart. Teach them the engrafted word which is able to save their souls. I was, I was on a business trip in, in Bristol, England one time and I got picked up and, and the guy that picked me up was a Christian. We started talking, and I don't even know how we got on the subject, but um, you know, we started talking about having, you know, training our kids and making sure that they're they're equipped to stand up to a lot of the doctrines that they're are being pushed in, the, you know, pushed down their throats. And and the and the man looked at me and said, you know, I I just I don't feel like we're supposed to force our kids into religion. I think we should just let them come to their own conclusions. <laughs> and I said, well, do you teach your kids math? Do you teach them arithmetic and algebra? Do you teach, or do you just let them come, you know, come to their own conclusion about what two plus two is, and, and what you know? Do you teach your kids history? Do you teach your kids? I mean, they'll they'll come to their own conclusions if you let them. A child left to his own devices brings shame to his mother. Okay, but if you train your kids to know the truth, the very truth that will set them free, the very truth that spoke into existence this universe, the, the very laws of gravity, the very laws of, of the conservation of energy, the very laws of thermodynamics, those same laws that, created, that God used to create the universe, the true and living God created those laws. Why would you not teach them the God who gave us law and, and math and truth and history? Okay. It was a good discussion. All right. Back to Romans chapter 10. 
And it goes on to say, um, but the word of God is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart, the word of faith that we preach. In verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So you repent, you turn, you turn, turn to God, okay? You realize you're in need of God. You realize that your righteousness can't, can't cut it. You're not going to climb a ladder to God. You've fallen short. Nothing can, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And it's going to have to be your blood. Like the old song says, most people don't find out till it's too late. Someone has to pay the price. You can pay it yourself or let someone else. But who would be that nice? To pay a debt that isn't his. I know someone like that. He's your best friend. He really is. He really loves you. It's a good Keith Green song if you guys ever get a chance to read it. But then if you confess God, God, you are God. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the mouth, or with the heart, man believes under righteousness, under right standing with God. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Confession is powerful, isn't it? That's why all false religions, right before they cut your head off or something, they try to get you to confess Allah, or to confess some other thing, or, or the communists, deny Jesus, or I'm going to put a bullet hole on your head. And, um, you know, confession's powerful. And they know that if they can get you to confess, to, to deny Christ, they've got you. Okay? Because confession's powerful. I, I think we live in a, in, in a very, very, very dangerous time. Because I see um, the power of confession. Do you guys see it? No. no. You know, what I mean by that is, you know, we have Oprah Winfrey coming on national you know, television saying, come out and confess your abortion. Be happy about it. Come out and confess it. Okay. Think about that for a second. If you come out, you can be forgiven of any sin, right? You can be forgiven of murder. You can be forgiven of genocide. The guy that wrote Amazing Grace was a slave trader. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. God can forgive. Moses murdered people. Paul probably took parents away from kids and orphaned kids and threw them in prison and who knows, killed Stephen. Okay, God can forgive sin. But what if you come out and confess that sin? It's something to, to wear as a badge of honor, or pride. Yes, I committed an abortion and I'm happy. And if you, you confess with your mouth your abortion and believe in your heart that that, that that abortion helped you to have a good life, it's almost like an anti-salvation. So, so, so dangerous. You know, and what happens? How, how do you recant once you've... And some of these kids, they're coming out on YouTube and they're denying, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's, it's frightening because I, I don't even think they know what they're doing. You know, honestly, I don't even think they know enough what the Holy Spirit is to even blaspheme it. But they're doing it just to say they did it and come out amongst the hundreds of thousands that are doing it with them. Denying Christ, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Okay. Confession's powerful. You confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, shall be saved. Okay. Another trick that, that, that they're doing in our public schools is getting kids to recite the Shahada. You guys know what the Shahada is? That's the Muslim statement of faith. You know, that's like, you know, when we confess Jesus and believe in our heart, they confess, you know, Muhammad and Allah. They confess Allah and his prophet Muhammad. And, and, and as part of their confession, they deny that our God is Israel. They deny Christ in their own confession. Um, and they trick our kids into saying it. Well, a poor kid looks back and he realizes, oh my gosh, I guess I'm a Muslim now. I mean, do you, do you see how treacherous and how sick and perverted this generation that we live in? I mean, God help this generation. God help these children who are 
being forced to do things that, that they don't even realize. Now, I do believe that God can save these kids, you know, just saying it doesn't, but it's powerful. I mean, what's the Bible say? If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, you know, what happens if these kids are learning from the time they're little kids to deny Christ? Through their friends, through their teachers, through their people on TV. God help them. And it goes on to say, um, for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in whom they have, have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And I, I was doing a word study, and I found something interesting looking up salvation in the Bible. And, and uh, the brother answered my question last week, but I asked everybody, I said, do you know what Jesus' name in the Hebrew is? It means it's, it's Yeshua. Okay? And what does Yeshua mean? Yeshua means salvation. It's, it's the Hebrew word for salvation, Yeshua. And I, and I just looked up salvation in the Bible, Yeshua. And I started reading verses. I have waited for thy, sal for thy salvation, O Lord, in Genesis 49. What's he saying there? I, I believe it's uh, Jacob praying a prayer. What's he saying? I have waited for thy Yeshua, O Lord. I have waited for thy Jesus. And in, in in Exodus 15, I believe it's Miriam and, and, and Moses, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my Yeshua, my salvation, my Jesus. Um, 1 Samuel 2, Hannah prays, my heart rejoices because I rejoice in thy Yeshua, in thy salvation. I rejoice in Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? God, God did that on purpose. Nothing is a coincidence in the Bible. When these people in the Old Testament were crying out for salvation, who were they crying out for? Jesus, save me. Jesus, I need your salvation. And in Psalm 9, it says, I will rejoice in thy Jesus, thy Yeshua. Okay. Um, salvation is beautiful, isn't it? That God condescends to our level. He saw that we were on the battlefield of life and couldn't do anything to save ourselves. And he's not a God that just allows us to die without any care. He loves us. The, you know, the Bible says he leaves the 99 to come after the one fallen sheep that wanders off. Okay, um, God, God loves us. The Bible said he tasted death for every man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him will not perish but have eternal life. If you think of the love of God for a second, it's beyond comprehension. Why would God love me? Someone who, shaking my fist, disagreeing with everything he stands for, doing, transgressing every line that he's drawn, I walked right over it. Why would God love me? You know, I'll spend the rest of eternity probably trying to get that answer. It's so easy, so why doesn't everybody get saved? If it's just a matter of turning and repenting of sins and confessing Jesus and believing in your heart that God raised him from death, that's not, it doesn't seem so hard to me. Yes, the stone was rolled away, he's not there. And nobody can show me where he's buried. They can show me where everybody else is buried and all these other so-called gods, but not Jesus. Okay, I can believe that. Why doesn't everybody do it? Why do you think? I think it costs too much. <clears throat> Wait a minute, it's free. All you gotta do is confess, right? What does it cost? Just everything, just your whole life. Just everything about the way you think, everything about the way that you live your life, everything about the way that, that, that you spend the rest of your days, it costs everything. What do I mean by that? 
Because to follow Christ is to pick up your cross daily and follow him. In fact, why don't we turn, turn to um, Matthew chapter 10, I believe. Let's see. Let's see here. Well, it's around here somewhere. And let me find it. You know what? I may not. Here, yeah, hold on. Uh, excuse me. Thirty-eight. Uh, you know what? I, I, I'm looking for where it says, "Pick up your cross." He that does not pick up his cross and follow me, and I'm, I'm just having trouble finding it right now. So, I tell you what. Unless you pick up your cross and follow Jesus, and what does it mean to pick up your cross? That man that used to commit those sins died. That man that used to go out partying, that used to go out carousing, that used to go out and get drunk, that used to do those things, was nailed to a, to a cross. So how was he nailed to a cross? Because I recognize that I'm dead to my sin. I need Christ. He needs to come in me. Okay, the Bible says we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, yet not us, but Christ lives in us. And the life which we now lead, we lead by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Okay, so that man who used to, to go carousing and, and getting drunk and doing all those things was dead at the day that I received Christ, the day that I received his death for my death, for my sins, his life for my life, and I allowed him to come in with me. That old man is nailed to a cross. Now I bear that cross. What is that cross? That cross is I live because he died. He, he purchased me with a price. There's nothing that I can do. I'm, I can't go back to that person because I, I'm a new person. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But I still carry about that cross to remember what Christ did for me and not go back to what I used to be. Okay. I remember we were talking the other night about Daniel chapter 3 where the young Jewish kids um, stood, stood before Nebuchadnezzar and he made this huge statue that was 66 feet tall and six feet wide. And, and he commanded that everyone in his kingdom, when they heard the, the, heard the musicians play, bow down and worship that statue. Everyone in the kingdom, everyone except certain Jews, just a few handful, wouldn't bow down. I really think today that, I mean, I grew up in kind of the 70s, 80s music, and, and I am convinced that the reason that, that Satan is keeping these, these minstrels around is so that they can be used when the mark of the beast comes. I, I, just, I just have a feeling. I mean, there's, you know, why else would some of the worst people that, that this world has ever seen um, stay, stay alive so long? I believe Satan's going to use these people. And I wouldn't doubt when the mark of the beast comes or when the beast and the image of the beast comes, he's going to pull out the Beatles and whoever's left of the Rolling Stones and whoever's, you know, the 80s and Beyonce and who knows. Um, but they start playing the music and these, everybody bows to this statue, which 666 is written all over it. 66 feet tall, six feet wide. But these three young men, and the young people in the Bible study were like, man, I hope, I hope I can do that. Because these three young men got thrown right into the fire. And what about those Muslims in the Middle East who won't confess Allah, who stay faithful to Jesus and get their head cut off? I hope I can do that. And I said, you know what? You're doing it now. As long as you're standing for Jesus now in, in a thousand little ways, you're going to be able to do it when it comes. Remember what Corey Tinboom said when she was talking to her father? 
Her, she's like, Dad, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can stay faithful. And her dad said, don't worry, Corey. God doesn't give you the ticket to the train two years earlier so you can lose it. He gives you the ticket right before you get on the train, right when you need it. He'll give you the strength. And she was able to make it, amen? She was able to make it through the worst tortures and things. Who knows what we're going to have to go through? But I know that, that if we stay faithful, if we carry our cross, if we're willing to not acquiesce to this world, and if we're willing to not give in to political correctness, if we're willing to, to stand up for God's word, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, are you? It's the very power of God and the salvation for those who believe. It is truth. And what's truth worth? Okay, what's truth worth to you? Stand for truth. What you're doing now is what you're going to be doing then. If you can stand now in the day of political correctness and in the day of fake news and in the day of, of LGBT and in the day of transgenders, if you can stand now, you'll be able to stand then. Right? Stay faithful. Fight the good fight. Back to Romans chapter 10. And it goes on. Uh, almost here. It says in verse 12, uh, no, I'm sorry, 14. Nope, how about 15? How shall they preach except they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Man, when somebody speaks the truth, isn't it beautiful? When you hear, like, even an economist come out and tell it like it is. When you hear a, a, an academic come out and tell it like it is. I just, I love it. I love the truth. The truth sets us free, right? Truth is so beautiful. Pastor Bill is speaking the truth right now in Ireland. I pray that God will bless the truth, that everywhere his feet tread, the word of God is going forth, and that people in darkness will see a great light. I just, I love the truth, and I hate to be lied to. I just absolutely hate it. I can see why Trump always says fake news. <laughs> it's fake. Okay. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Well, to believe truth, you've got to want to believe it, right? When you hear truth, there's got to be something in you that resonates with truth. You've got to want to hear the truth. Unfortunately, we live in a day where truth is held in low regard. A lot of people don't want to know the truth. They don't care. They just want to get along. Or they just want to fit in. Or they just want to go along with the spirit of the age and not make waves. Or be the politically correct one. You know what? I'd rather fail in every area of my life except truth. What matters? It's the truth that sets us free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I don't care if I have a million jobs and lose every one of them because I stand for truth. As long as I've got truth to hold on to. Because something taught me that that truth is the truth that leads to salvation. Amen? We need truth. <clears throat> but who has believed our report? So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You can grow your faith. You can grow your faith. Continue to hear. Continue to hear truth. Continue to train yourself to block out lies. Continue to, to learn to trust in the word of God, which is able to save, save men's souls. In the book of Hosea, it says, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Okay. We live in a generation where they don't even know their left hand from their right, whether they're boys or girls, what bathroom they should use, what clothes they should wear. Should they, wear, should they act like a boy or a girl? These people have lost it. But if you hold on to truth, that will anchor you. Jesus Christ is the anchor of our souls. and He will keep you. His truth will be the rock with which you stand on. In fact, I, I, I seriously wonder if we, have, we live in a generation of, of mass mental illness. If you can't discern whether... Somebody's a boy or a girl, or up or down, or right or left. 
that's mental illness. Okay? Or, or if you can hold two contradictory views simultaneously, <laughs> that's called mental illness. Okay. But the truth will keep you and anchor you. Logic will hold you and protect your mind. Guard your hearts and minds. Do you believe that today? The Bible says, um, uh, the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You can increase your faith by learning to trust in God's word. Okay, when you mess up, it says if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. If you feel like you're not saved, and how many wake up and sometimes you just don't feel saved? Happens to me all the time. I go right back to Romans 10, 9 and 10. Lord, you said if we confess with our mouth, the Lord Jesus, you promised, Lord. I hold, Lord, help me, help me to hold on to this and believe this precious promise. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Amen? So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And faith... The Word of God opens up your ears too. It helps you to hear. Helps you to discern between true news and fake news. Helps you to discern between darkness and light. Helps you to hear, hear the truth and be able to filter out the darkness. Okay. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound has gone out into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses said... I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by them that are a foolish nation, I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. And he's talking about us. All of us are here today not because we were seeking God, because God sought us. <laughs> we weren't seeking the gospel, the gospel sought us. We were, our ancestors were, were worshiping rocks and sticks and sacrificing their own children. And yet the truth and the light shine right in on them. And that truth set men of Europe free and, and, and our ancestors. And uh, the gospel ended up coming to us. And it says, but to Israel, he says, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gain same people. And we're going to close here, but turn to Hosea 5. Hosea chapter 5, right after Daniel. Hosea chapter 5. And the Lord, many, many years before, predicted that Israel was going to deny him. He said, they will not be my people. I will not be their God. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It says in one place, it says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod. And afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek their God and David their king and shall the fear of the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. And in verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 15, it says, and this is the Lord speaking, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face, and in their affliction they will seek me earlier. Remember what Jesus said, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And now the Lord says to Israel, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn, but he will heal us. He has smitten, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And in the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. A day to the Lord is as how many years? A thousand years. A day to the Lord is as a thousand years. It says that, I believe, in, 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 in Psalm 90. And uh, how many days has it been since Jesus went to the cross? Two days. After two days, he will revive us. And in the third day, he will raise us up. We shall live in his sight. Then we shall know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, the latter and the former rain unto the earth. The Bible says it was because of the rejection of the gospel and the rejection of Christ that Jesus came to us. 
But if the rejection of Christ has meant salvation to the rest of the world, what's the salvation of the Jews going to be? But life from the dead, resurrection, <laughs> us living in his presence together with David and, and uh, Noah and Adam and Eve and Gideon and, okay? And I believe that's, that's gonna be the start of the third day is all of us resurrected with Christ in Israel on the Temple Mount celebrating the wedding feast of the Lamb. And I live for that day, don't you? Lord, I pray that that day is even tomorrow. Who knows, maybe even tonight we'll be there with Jesus. But lift up your head, for when you see these things, your redemption draws nigh. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for your word, Lord. Thank you for your precious promises. That all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And you said, Lord, you'll never leave us or forsake us. You'll be with us right to the end. And Lord, you said 365 times, fear not. Help us not to fear as we see these things come to pass. But help us to lift up our heads and know that our redemption draws very near. Help us to have your peace which passes all understanding. Guard our hearts and our minds in these last days. Help us, Lord. Increase our faith and our knowledge of you. And may we tell others before the great and terrible day of the Lord. If you'll do this, Father, we'll give you the praise forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.